Welcome to our next video in this series on condensed matter theory. In this video, I want to talk about the kramers kronig relations. In the last few videos, we've discussed the response functions and we've shown that they have a real and an imaginary part. Um, and the imaginary part of the susceptibility is related to absorption. Um, the real part of the susceptibility relates the induced dipole moment that you find in an electromagnetic field, for example, the electric dipole moment. Um, so both of them have definite meanings. Now, what I want to show you in this and what the kramers kronig relations actually state is that the real part of the susceptibility and the imaginary part of the susceptibility are related to each other. If you know one, you know the other. So actually, it's only a single valued function that you can choose. So the real part of chi of omega and the imaginary part of chi and omega are related. Now for this, to prove, we have to make a few assumptions on the sustainability that are all um, well fulfilled. And the first assumption that the susceptibility has to fulfill is that chi of omega falls off faster than one over omega, when omega to infinite. And actually that has to be true because you know that omega times chi of omega is sigma of omega and sigma of omega has to fall off when you, omega goes to infinite and f of omega is actually omega squared times chi of omega and omega squared times chi of omega goes to a constant when omega goes to infinite. So it definitely has to fall off faster than one over omega otherwise you would have infinite scattering. It has to fall off as one over omega squared. So an easy fulfillable requirement. You can even uh, write this down mathematically for all epsilon larger than zero. There is an R element of all real numbers such that omega times chi of omega is smaller than epsilon for all omega larger or equal than r. And as said, this has to be easily fulfillable because chi of omega has to fall off as one over omega squared. Now, there is another condition that has to be fulfilled and that is chi of omega is analytical, has no poles, in upper half complex plane. So if you look at the complex plane, real omega imaginary part of omega, then we can have poles. But they almost lie below the real axis. Now the reason to do this is that when you take an integral over the real axis then you can add a contour including the upper half complex plane and the integral over that contour is going to be zero because there are no poles inside and the integral over the upper half here is going to be zero because we know that our Sustainability falls off faster than 1 over omega. Now, instead of, uh, so what we know is that the contour integral of chi of omega, the omega is the integral of minus infinite to infinite of chi of omega d omega plus the limit of r to infinite zero to pi chi of r e to the i theta r 
the theta. And we know that this has to be zero, but you also know that this part has to be zero because chi falls off fast enough. Now, that's all nice, but this doesn't give you a relation between the real and the imaginary part yet. What we now can do is induce one pole inside the upper half of the complex plane, and the standard is to put that pole exactly on the real axis, and then take a principal value integral. So chi of omega of omega prime minus omega. This has one pole exactly at omega is omega prime. So if we now look at the contour integral over the upper half plane of that function, then this is equal to the principal value integral over the real axis because the upper arc is giving you zero. It's the zero for chi of omega, so it's definitely zero for chi of omega divided by omega. It should be omega prime. Chi of omega prime, omega prime minus omega, the omega prime. But this is also equal to the uh, residue of the pole that we have because it's a closed contour integral. So this is i pi times the residue of chi omega prime divided by omega prime minus omega. And we have a pole when omega is equal to omega prime and the residue is then chi omega prime. So it's this is i pi chi of omega. Now what we have for the kramers kronig relations is that the integral of chi omega prime divided by omega prime minus omega, the omega is i pi chi of omega. Now to see that indeed this relates to real and the imaginary part with each other, we can take the real part of both of these equations. So the principal value integral minus infinite to infinite of the real part of chi of omega prime, omega prime minus omega, the omega is the real part of i times something is the imaginary part of that function. So indeed, you can calculate the imaginary part from the real part instead of taking the real part we can take the imaginary part and then the imaginary part of i times a function is the real part of that function so this is pi times the real part of chi of omega so once you know the real or the imaginary part, you can always retrieve the other by the kramers kronig relations. Um, in practice, calculating the real part from the imaginary part is very doable. The imaginary part falls off fast enough. Calculating the uh, imaginary part from the real part is very hard because the real part only falls off too slowly. Um, these are very important relations um, because they basically tell you that it's only a single valued function and not a two valued function that you have to know to determine your system. Um, it also tells you that something like the index of refractivity completely determines your susceptibility, the absorption completely determines your susceptibility, um, your scattering length completely determines the susceptibility. So single measurements as a function of frequency are sufficient to completely determine your susceptibility of that system. For now, thank you very much. Stay healthy. We see each other later. <laughs>